but we're going to be working AP Precal homework 3.3, which is mostly about rational function and behavior. So we're going to start talking about this graph of h of x. It has asymptotes at x equals 4 and y equals 2. Use limit to notation to describe the horizontal asymptote location. All right, so the horizontal asymptote, that's going to be a horizontal line. And, you know, just to draw a horizontal line, it's the set of all points in the coordinate plane that share a y coordinate, right? And so we're looking for something like y equals 2. And something that would describe a horizontal asymptote. And so it's going to be a y equals type equation. And so, you know, we don't really know all that much about the function h of x, but it's going to be a rational function. And so we'll say that the limit as x approaches infinity, because that's like we'll used for code for in behavior in this class, it's going to be the limit of h of x is equal to 2. And with rational functions, we know it's the case that unless there's like some sort of like really restricted domain outside of, you know, natural restrictions from holes and vertical asymptotes, uh, whoops, we're going to need, uh, we're going to also have the same end behavior to the other side. So as x approaches infinity or negative infinity, x is going to, I mean, h is going to approach 2. Alright, next one is going to be a table, and we're going to use limit notation to describe the end behavior, at least on A. And the thing about this one, if you've got a rational function, it'll have the same end behavior, uh, provided the degree in the numerator is less than or equal to the degree of the denominator. It's going to be the same for both sides. And that's all the situations that we're looking at right now. This one's only going to have it to one side, which would make it an exponential function, which we're not talking about quite yet. But we're just talking about the limit notation for the end behavior, so I don't think that's going to be too big of a deal for you all. So as x approaches negative infinity here on the left, like, right, I'm going from 0 to negative 1,000. So it's getting really negative. As x approaches negative infinity, it looks like y, f of x, is getting closer and closer to 2. So I'm going to say the limit of f of x as x approaches negative infinity is going to be 2. Okay, because the farther I go, the more decimals are staying the same, right? Um, I'm getting 2.1, 2.01, 2.001. I bet, you know, more and more decimals would stay 0 the farther I went to the left. And, you know, see, I'm approaching 2. And the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x, as I go this way, I'm saying it's pretty much f of x is decreasing without bound. It's going to 50, negative 50,000, so that's pretty large. We're going to say the limit is negative infinity. All right, on b, we're going to do the same thing, but we're also going to analyze the behavior around x equals 0. Yeah, kind of like we did last time. Okay, because so it looks like at x equals 0, we're going to have an undefined situation, and on either side, we're seeing really large numbers, so that's you know, probably going to be a vertical asymptote. All right, so first let's do the end behavior. It says x approaches negative infinity. As I go to the left, looks like f is approaching negative 6. Okay, as x approaches positive infinity, I guess I go that way, uh, looks like I'm again approaching negative 6. Okay, so limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is equal to negative 6. And they also wanted to talk about limit notation to describe the behavior of the graph around x equals 0. Alright, so as x approaches 0 from the right hand side, from the positive side, where the numbers are actually positive, the limit of f of x is looking like it's going to go to negative infinity. Negative 7, negative 700, negative 7,000, that's going to negative infinity. And then as x approaches 0 from the negative side, f of x is getting larger and larger. Uh, it's going 7, 700, 7,000, that's, that's going to be going positive infinity. one is given the equation for f of x, find the equation of the horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so this, we're thinking in behavior of the rational function, degree and leading coefficient of the numerator and denominator. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to think about the numerator of f. So for this first one, so if I was to multiply this out, it would start with the, you know, the highest degree terms, the negative 3x times the 4x. 
So I'd have negative 12x squared. And actually, I am going to multiply this one out just for the sake of example. Um, now, if you can just see that it's going to be negative 12x squared over 9x squared, and just you can go from there to negative 12 over 9, good for you. Um, I'm going to just multiply this out. Negative 3x plus 8x is going to be positive 5x and then positive 2. Okay. I bet 3x plus 2 squared would be 9x squared. 6 and 6 is 12x and 4. Alright, and then if we want to look at what will determine our end behavior, do that in red. Take the quotient of the leading terms. Okay, so that'll be negative 12x squared over 9x squared equals negative 12 over 9, which is going to be negative 4 thirds. And so the equation of the horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals negative 4 thirds. And the reason why that's valid is because of the kind of the limit analysis as x approaches infinity. And I'll make sure to do that because I'm sure that we've got some, you know, limit as x approaches infinity of a rational function coming up. And I'll make sure to do that analysis, you know, just to remind you of why it was valid for us to just divide the, the, uh, the leading terms of the numerator and denominator. All right, on this one, it's already multiplied out. And this is another case where we see, like, you know, sometimes it's beneficial to have something factored, and sometimes it's beneficial to have it kind of in standard form. Uh, it just depends on what you're needing, right? Are you needing the zeros and the vertical asymptotes, or are you looking for the end behavior? If you're looking for the end behavior, it's good to have it multiplied out. Okay, so to look for the thing that will determine our end behavior, that they have a name for this, We're going to look at 8x squared divided by 4x squared, which is equal to 8 over 4, which is 2. Okay, so our horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals 2. And just grab the highest power term in numerator and denominator and divide them. That will give you your end behavior for a rational function. All right, next we're going to use limit notation to describe the end behavior of the rational function. This is what I was talking about. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say, all right, you know, I'm going to do it the same way, uh, at least for the first one, and then I'm going to go through and I'll show you why what we did is legitimate. Yeah, this will be the perfect example. So f of x equals 2x squared minus 2x over 3x squared. So, you know, to determine the end behavior, I'm going to grab the high degree terms. I'm going to say, all right, I'm investigating. It's a little zoomed in. 2x squared over 3x squared. x squareds would cancel, and that's 2 thirds. Okay, so we'll say that the limit of f of x as x approaches positive infinity, and this will be true for negative infinity as well, so I guess I'm going to just write plus or minus infinity, because the for these rational functions that have the degree on top, less than or equal to the degree on bottom, it's going to be the same for both sides. So I'm just going to write that for all four of these. That's going to be two-thirds. But if you're sitting there like, I'm not sure why, why, why exactly does that work, that's where we're going to go, and we're going to do a little bit of algebra on the original expression. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by one over the highest power term on top and bottom. So the biggest power term I see in this whole thing is x squared. So I'm going to multiply by one over x squared on top and bottom. And I'm just multiplying by one, um, provided x isn't zero. But we're talking about the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity. So it's definitely not where x is equal to zero. And then if I was to distribute this one over x squared in over you know, all of these things, uh, basically what it would do is it would decrease the power of x in all of these expressions by two powers. So this is going to be 2x squared over 2x squared is 2 minus, whoops, so minus, okay, 2x over x squared is like 2 over x. And then I'm going to be dividing by 3x squared over x squared is 3. So if I'm interested in taking the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, 
what I'm really taking the limit as x approaches infinity of is 2 minus 2 over x divided by 3. This is another way of writing it. And then as x approaches infinity, this 2 over x right here, it's going to approach 0, right? Because the bigger x gets and the 2 is staying the same, you know, the smaller the quotient gets 2 divided by x. You're dividing by more and more and more. You're left with less and less and less. So I've got, you know, this limit is going to come back as 2 minus 0 divided by 3, right? The bigger x gets, the smaller 2 over x gets. And so this is 2 thirds. And so that's another reason why that limit is going to be 2 thirds. The shortcut for that is we just divide the leading terms. That's really going to be the thing to do on this one, because uh, we don't want to multiply this all out and go through and divide by the highest power term. We really, really don't want to get into that at all. So what we're going to do instead is just envision what if we did. Okay, so d of x, I just need to make this pen a little thinner. So if I was to multiply it all out, on the top I'd have 3x times 2x times x, and so that would be 3 total powers of x multiplied by 3 times 2 is 6. So 6x to the 3, plus a bunch of stuff that I'm not going to care about in terms of like finding the end behavior. Okay, in the denominator, I'm going to multiply x squared times 2x times x to get my leading term, and that would be x squared third fourth power, yeah, and multiplied by 2. So it would be 2x to the 4 plus a bunch of other stuff. To determine the end behavior, I'm going to look at the ratio of the lead terms. So that would be like considering 6x to the 3 over 2x to the 4. And that is, if I was to simplify it, I'd get a 3 in the numerator and an x in the denominator. And so we think about the end behavior of 3 over x. As x approaches infinity, 3 over x goes towards 0 because the 3 is staying constant and the x is growing. And so with a denominator that's growing faster than the numerator, we're going to be approaching 0. And so we'll say, all right, for this one, the limit of d of x as x approaches infinity or negative infinity, that's going to be 0. This one, we'll think about, again, same, same kind of idea. What would happen if I was to rewrite g of x, you know, like fully expanded? And so I'd have, you know, 3x times 3x times 3x. So I'd have 3 powers of x and 3 powers of 3. So that's going to be 27x to the 3 and, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. That really won't impact the end behavior, though. And then the denominator, my leading, co or leading term would be negative x times 2x times 4x, 3 powers of x, negative 1 times 2 times 4, that's negative 8. So if I'm considering what is the end behavior, I'm looking at the ratio of the lead terms. Say that's 27x cubed divided by 8x cubed. If I was to divide those, I'd have 27 over 8. Um, and even though those are both cubed numbers, I'm not going to be able to simplify them any further because they're, you know, 27 is 3 threes and 8 is 3 twos, so you know, I can't cancel any common factors. And so I'll say, all right, the equation of the vertical or the horizontal asymptote would be y equals 27 over 8 but we're using limit notation to describe the end behavior so that's going to be the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity of g of x that's going to equal 27 eighths okay now this one over here r of x okay if we were to what was I thinking here? Um, I compl oh no, yeah, I didn't know what I was saying. If we were to say, okay, look at this. Okay, look, the degree on the bottom exceeds the degree on top. The limit is zero. That's totally fine. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. I'm going to go through and do the exact same thing every time, just for the sake of clarity. It's like uh, dividing the the leading terms of each polynomial by each other. 
and but you know if you just see it's bigger on bottom it's going to go to y equals zero uh, or the limit's going to be zero good for you just go ahead and write that down and move on but what's going to happen when i simplify the leading terms so i'm going to get a three over five x the denominator will be growing while the numerator stays constant that goes towards zero so i'm going to report the limit of r of x as x approaches infinity or negative infinity uh, that's going to be equal to zero. And that means that the equation of the horizontal asymptote to the graph of r of x is going to be y equals zero. All right, this next one's kind of interesting. It says, write an equation for a rational function that has, okay, so we're going to start off and we know it's going to be a y equals some kind of fraction. So I'm just drawing a fraction bar there and trying to fill in the factors as I figure them out. All right, a whole at x equals negative three. Okay, so I know that means I've got an x plus 3 on top and bottom. And a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. Okay, so I need to have an x minus 2 in the denominator that is not in the numerator. An x-intercept at x equals 0, that's like a, uh, at a 0. And so that's a 0 of the numerator, and so x minus 0. And a horizontal asymptote of y equals 3. Okay. So the way I get a horizontal asymptote is by you know having the same degree on top and bottom and having the and kind of the ratio of the leading coefficients be three over one. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply by three here. Uh, you could change it to a three x or a three x plus nine this is the other factor if you wanted to be like really fancy. Uh, but I'm just going to multiply by three on top um, because if I was to multiply this out, I'd have a three x squared plus you know nine x in the numerator and then an x squared plus an x minus six in the denominator, and the ratio of the lead terms would give me three. Okay, and so I think that's gonna be good enough for us. Yeah, that's gonna be a good equation. For B, we want a vertical asymptote at x equals six only. Okay, that only is interesting, but I remember that, that these get, um, have a little bit more to them in a second. Okay, so vertical asymptote at x equals six only, so that means x minus 6 is going to be down here in the denominator. x intercepts at x equals 4 and x equals 2, so I'm going to put those on top. A whole at x equals 3, so that must mean x minus 3 is in the numerator and the denominator. And a horizontal asymptote, y equals 1 fourth. Okay, so you would want the ratio of the leading terms to be 1 over 4. So we would need like a 4 down here, right? And so, but it's like, oh, it doesn't work, does it? Because I have 3 degrees in the numerator and only 2 in the denominator. I'm going to need to have equal degrees on top and bottom to have a horizontal asymptote that's y equals some number that isn't y equals 0. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, all right, well, I guess I'm going to need to add some multiplicity to the denominator. Now, I can't add the multiplicity to the x minus 3, right? Because if I added a multiplicity of 2 there, um, it would still cancel. But I, then I'd have a uh, vertical asymptote at x equals 3. So I know it has to be right here, um, squaring the x minus 6, because then I'll have three powers of x. And the you know ratio of the leading coefficients will be one to four, and I'll have the horizontal asymptote there, and everything else will fit. And then part C, horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So that means we have to have more powers in the denominator than we had in the numerator. But I think this one's another multiplicity trick, um, if memory serves. So horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So I need to have more powers of x in the denominator than the numerator. Zero is at x equals one, and x equals three. whole at x equals 5. Vertical asymptote at x equals 2. Okay, and so I think at this point, um, we've got a couple of options. Uh, what we could do is we could just add other vertical asymptotes until, you know, like maybe at x equals 4, x equals 0, you know, things like that, until we had 4 degrees in the denominator. Or what we could do is we could just add multiplicity to the vertical asymptote we already have. I think if we gave this multiplicity 3, then the denominator would have total 4 powers of x, whereas the numerator only had 3, and that would give us a bigger on bottom fraction that would have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. 
All right. Now the next one's kind of a similar idea. Um, we're going to look at the horizontal asymptote of r of x equals p of x. Or, yeah, p over q. So I'm going to just write out r of x as best I can figure it out, and I think that'll I think that'll help. P has zeros at x equals five with multiplicity two, so x minus five squared, and x equals negative two, so x minus negative two multiplicity one. Q has a double root at x equals one. A triple root at x equals four, so that's x minus four to the three. What, are the what is the horizontal asymptote of r of x? Okay, so what we need to do is think about, you know, probably the degrees would be enough on this one because I see on top I've got third degree and on bottom I've got fifth degree. I've got a faster growing polynomial in the denominator. That's going to go towards zero. Um, but if you wanted to, you know, do it the officially AP Precal approved way where we're dividing the leading terms, well, I'd say, all right, well, r of x is going to equal x to the third plus a bunch of other stuff divided by x to the fifth plus a bunch of other stuff, which means that it's going to have the same behavior as the ratio of these things. Okay, looking at x to the 3 divided by x to the 5 is equivalent to 1 over x squared, which I think is pretty apparent will go towards 0 as x goes towards infinity. And so, but it asked what is the horizontal asymptote, so it's going to be an equation, a horizontal line, to y equals some number, and it's y equals 0. Okay, given the graph of a portion of the rational function g of x, what could a and b and c and d be given the expression for g of x? Okay. I think we're going to assume that the coordinates of the whole are at 2 and 2. I think that'll work out best for us. All right, so what we really are going to need is think about the whole first. I think that, that'll be the easiest thing. We've got a whole at x equals 2. So that means to me that I think b is going to need to equal 2, because that's the factor I'm seeing on top and bottom. Because that was a factor that could cancel. Okay, then we'll be able to see the vertical asymptote next. I think it's kind of the next thing. Okay, over here I'm seeing vertical asymptote x equals negative 1. Okay, so that'll be the factor that's left over. So I would have an x plus 1 in the denominator. That means d equals 1. All right, so what is A going to be? Oh, okay, A is going to be determined by the coordinate of the x-intercept, which is right there. Okay, x-intercept negative 3. That's going to be a 0 of the numerator, okay, that isn't canceled off by, you know, the, a 0 of the denominator. So that's going to be x plus A. And so I would be expecting an x plus 3 from x equaling negative 3, so I've got a equals 3. And the last thing is c, which must have to do with the horizontal asymptote. So horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals positive 1. All right, so c is going to end up being... Uh, no, it's going to be 1, right? Yeah, because I need to have x squared on top, x squared on bottom. I need to have a uh, ratio of 1 to 1. So c needs to just be 1. It can't be anything else. Okay, so that was interesting. What was the graph of g of x? Kind of the same thing. Where are the values of a and b and c? And it looks like d, too. I see, well, I see b, no, I see a, b, c, and d. So we're going to need to find all four of these. All right, so first thing first. I'd say probably the location of the hole, but I did that in blue last time. x equals 4. So that's going to be the factor that's there on top and bottom. That's x plus c. Well, I'd expect to have an x minus 4 over x minus 4. So to me, that means that c is going to have to be negative 4, x plus negative 4. All right, next I might look at the vertical asymptote. And that's x equals negative 1. So that's going to be the leftover factor in the denominator after canceling. So that's the x plus d. Okay, I would need d to be positive 1 in order for x plus d to equal 0, causing the whole denominator of the fraction to be 0 and, you know, getting un undefined in a vertical asymptote. So d is going to be negative 1. Okay. 
other thing was, oh yeah, the, the zero. Okay, that's happening at x equals two. So that's going to be the leftover factor of the numerator, which looks to me like x plus b. So b is going to be, that's what's happening here, um, negative 2, right? I would expect an x minus 2 if x equals 2 is a 0. Um, but it's an x plus b, so it'll be x plus the negative 2. And then the last thing is going to be the horizontal asymptote. Um, let's see, that's right here at y equals 1. And so if we're going to have, you know, it would, if I was to multiply 3 times x minus 4 times x minus 1, you know, knowing what c and d are in the denominator, I'd get 3x squared plus some other stuff. Um, but I know that the horizontal asymptote is y equals 1, so to me that means that a is going to need to also equal 3. So I have that ratio of, of leading terms being, you know, 3x squared over 3x squared, which would be y equals 1. All right, now this is the graph of ooh, f of x equals ax minus 4 over x plus b. What are a and b? All right, so we really just need to look at the picture of the asymptotes and not worry too much about the rest of it. So x plus b, that's going to be probably the easiest way for us to go um, from the vertical asymptote. Okay, so x plus b is equal to 0. Okay, where we've got the vertical asymptote, that's at x equals 5. Okay, so that means 5 plus b equals 0. And so that means b equals negative 5. Get the horizontal asymptote, we're going to look at the ratio of the leading terms, which uh, I guess I was doing that in green before, but I'm just going to, yeah, or red, or some other color. So I'm going to say for the end behavior, I'm going to have ax over x equals a, but we know that the horizontal asymptote was equal to negative 2, so that just means that a is going to equal negative 2. And I'm just going to kind of leave it there. All right, the next type of question we got here is this, like, here's some limits, sketch the simplest form of the graph. So this is going to be, I think some of these have holes in them too, but the, like this first one's the, the simplest equivalent. Um, make ourselves, you know, an xy plane, and then we're going to say, all right, we need to kind of like label our asymptotes. So maybe I'll do the horizontal asymptote in red. Okay, so that's the as x approaches positive and negative infinity, y is approaching 2. So I'm going to just draw in what I think y equals 2 looks like. And then for the vertical asymptote, I'm going to be seeing that's where the limit is infinity, so that's here and there. Okay, so that's going to be at x equals 3, and so I'll decide where I think x equals 3 is, and I'll draw my vertical asymptote there. I feel like I could have made it a little bit longer, you know, about like that. And let's see, all right, x equals 3 here, and then I can draw, you know, there's not any other information about this curve, so I'm just going to draw something that looks like this. Um, you know, it could be up here, or you could draw it down here, where we can't draw it. I don't even actually like that one, because uh, we cannot be crossing a vertical asymptote. A horizontal asymptote can be crossed. Um, it seems like it's not going to be really like a big deal in AP Pre-Cal, but I'm going to mention it right here. Um, horizontal asymptote can be crossed. It's just like the overall line behavior. We're going to eventually get closer and closer to y equals 2. Um, on sort of other information, we can say that's a perfectly fine picture of what the graph could look like. It can't be over here because then all of a sudden it wouldn't be a function. Okay, that, that's, that's a problem. We're talking about rational functions here, not rational things that aren't functions. All right, so f of 1 is undefined. I'm going to still need a grid, though. And that'll do. Uh, as x approaches 1, our limit is 2 from both sides. That must mean that we've got ourselves a um, hole in the graph of f at x equals 1. I'll actually draw it this way. Looks like we've got more action going on here. Anyway, so I'm going to mark off where I think 1 and 2 is. And I'm going to put a hole there. 
because I know the graph is going to be needing to approach that um, based on those limit statements. Okay, then as x approaches zero from the negative and positive side, I'm seeing infinities, right? So that's going to be a vertical asymptote, which I'm pretty sure. I want to do that in blue last time, so I'm just kind of say, hey, yeah, this is a vertical asymptote as well. This is not going to be crossed by my graph. All right, and then the last thing is as x approaches infinity and negative infinity, that's going to give me my end behavior. Y is approaching three, so I need a horizontal asymptote of y equals three. I'm just going to put it there. And Okay, and from here, I can draw the simplest form of a graph. Well, I'm going to respect the vertical asymptote and also the hole in the graph. And my end behavior, I'm going to get closer and closer there. That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, okay, let's stop there. And, you know, I don't know that it's not happening like this. You know, it's possible to have togetherness around a vertical asymptote. I'm not sure what happened to my arrow, but okay, there we go. Um, and that's a, that's a decent sketch. All right, so here we have another one where it's just one horizontal asymptote and one vertical asymptote. All right, so the limit as x approaches infinity and negative infinity is zero. So it probably means that we've got a bigger on bottom fraction. So that means that my horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Okay. And then the vertical asymptote is going to be x equals five because as x approaches five from either side, I'm seeing infinities. Okay, so I'm going to draw a vertical asymptote right here. I'll label that as x equals 5 and then just draw a graph from there and it, it really could be uh, just just whatever you want as long as it looks like we're respecting the asymptotes okay so that'll be good that'll be a perfectly fine sketch um if you wanted to you could come back in and you know, put in a, a y-axis right there um you know, label it y and this would also be the x-axis y equals zero but um but i don't think you have to f of zero is undefined, but the limit of f as x approaches zero is defined in equals seven. So that means I'm going to have a hole in the graph at x equals zero and y equals seven. In fact, I'll just write that right here. Okay, then the next thing, the limit as x approaches four is infinity and infinity. Also, let me make sure. I See, you know what? I was not careful about this at all. Um, I'm realizing I have not been like actually looking at which of the infinities it was, and that's uh, that's sloppy. Hold on. Um, fortunately, on number ten, I was right. I just happened to be lucky. On number eleven, I was not right. Okay, but this is actually a really good opportunity to see that a, a horizontal asymptote can't be crossed. Oh, this is really nice, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, this is exactly how it would happen. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna correct the error. Um, pardon me, um, if you were sitting there thinking like, what is he doing? Um, all right, so I know that this has got to go towards this horizontal asymptote eventually, and I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, but we gotta respect the vertical asymptote here. Start with that, and then maybe it'll go down and then up. You know, we don't know. Uh, but right there, you see it, it was crossed. Um, and that's actually a really good example of how a horizontal asymptote can be crossed. Um, something like that. Okay, so I think, yeah, that looks good to me. Because as I approach zero from the negative side, I'm going to negative infinity. As I approach zero from the positive side, I'm going to positive infinity. Um, the limit as, I, as x approaches positive or negative infinity of f is three. Again, there's a hole at one and two. Yeah, okay, whoops, pardon me. All right, so this one's also off because I wasn't looking and seeing that as x approached 5 from the negative side, y was approaching positive infinity. Okay, so I should probably just draw it like that. And then as x approached 5 from the positive side, y was going to approach negative infinity. That's a little bit sloppy, but, you know, I went it's all fixed now. Okay, hole at x equals zero and y equals seven over here. Um, both sides, as I'm approaching x equals four, I'm having a vertical asymptote. So I'm gonna say vertical asymptote x equals four. Okay. And then over here, x approaches infinity, x approaches negative infinity. That's telling me about the end behavior, which is the horizontal asymptote. That's y equals negative one. So I'm gonna draw in these asymptotes. 
y equals negative 1 and x equals 4. We know on both sides of x equals 4, y is going to be approaching positive infinity. It's just we also have this hole at x equals 0 and y equals 7. So I'm just going to decide that's going to be about here. Uh, and so then... Approaching here... And approaching like that. Um, 0, 7, well that's going to be on the y-axis. Just draw my y-axis right through there. Um, you could, if you wanted to, draw an x-axis, and I think just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to draw it right there. Um, it's not going to be very drawn to scale, you know, in terms of 4, negative 1, and 7. Uh, it's going to be all out of scale. That doesn't really matter, I don't think. So we're just making a sketch here. And that's going to be a sketch of the graph of the function with the horizontal and vertical asymptotes. All right, now we're going to do a little bit more computing the limit. I bet these are mixed, and then we'll do some rational inequalities, and then we'll be done. This is a much shorter, more reasonable homework than the last one. The last one was pretty long. All right, so this one, I'm going to go kind of the faster way. I'm thinking, you know, I see x approaches infinity. I'm thinking n behavior. Um, I look at the ratio of the leading terms, that's, you know, 2x to the third over negative x to the fourth, that's negative 2 over x, that's going to 0 as x approaches infinity, uh, it's faster growing on bottom, I'm going to just say it's 0, I'm not going to go in and do that whole computation. Alright, here is x approaches 3 from the positive side, this is not an n behavior, so I should just try plugging in x equals 3 first, so that would be 2x squared is 9, plus 18 is, wait, no, 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 2 times 9 is, is 18, plus another 18 is 36, divided by, um, I'm going to actually make that an arrow, not an equals, because this is not going to be true, I think we're going to be divided by 0, uh, 9 plus 3 is 12, minus 12 is 0, yeah, 36 over 0, that means I'm sitting on a vertical asymptote. So, much like in the last lesson, my job is now down to determining which infinity I'm approaching. Because okay, so I know I'm sitting on a vertical asymptote, so I'm right here at x equals 3. I know there's a vertical asymptote. I'm approaching from the positive side. So I'm going to choose a test point of, you know, something like 3.1 or 3.01. I'm probably going to want to factor this expression um, as much as possible in order to de make that determination of sine. So I'm going to say, all right, 2x squared plus 18, I can say that's 2 times x squared plus 9. Uh, it's not going to be super helpful. You're going to have to just be thinking about it numerically, but I'll, I'll help you with that. And then the denominator is x minus 3 and x minus 1. Okay. Now, in the numerator, the 2 is always going to be positive. And then the x squared plus 9 is also always going to be positive, right? Because any real number you plug in for x, you square it, it's positive, and then you add 9, it's even more positive. Uh, except for 0, if you plug in 0 and square it, that's 0, and then you add 9, you get 9, that's definitely positive. And then down here, x minus 3, if x was 3.1, I'd have 0.1 left, okay, so that would be a positive number. And then 3.1 minus 1 is 2.1, which is also positive. This is all positive stuff here. And so I know that I'm positive while approaching a vertical asymptote. That means the limit has got to be positive infinity. Positive side of 2x squared plus 18 divided by x squared minus 4x plus 3, uh, that is positive infinity based on the sketch. All right, this one, kind of same idea. I'm seeing we're not approaching infinity or negative infinity, so I'm going to try just plugging in. Let's say it approaches, okay, so x approaches negative 1. 3 times negative 1 squared is 3. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4 plus 1. That's a 0 on top. On the bottom, I'm going to have x minus 3x plus 1. Okay, yeah, and so that is going to go 0. I'm not needing to factor quite yet. If I squared it, I would get 1 
plus 2 minus 3. All right, yeah, so it's 0 over 0. Okay, so what I need to do now is factor and cancel. If I get 0 and 0. So I'm going to rewrite the expression. I'm going to try to factor 3x squared plus 4x plus 1. Um, let's say this is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the negative side. Of, okay, if I multiply the 3 times 1, I get 3. Um, I think this one, okay, there's only, if it's going to be factorable, which i gotta, I got to assume it will be. Okay. I'm going to need both of these to be a positive 1. Okay, I'm not going to be splitting the middle term on this. And then to get 3x squared, I mean, I guess I could have negative 1 and negative 1, but that would lead to me having a negative middle term, okay, which I don't. So I know that it's just going to be 3x and an x. Um, if you need help with that factoring, um, you can either just check it by foiling or do it by splitting the middle term or whatever you got to do, um, or come talk to me about it. But I'm um, going to say, all right, this one was x minus 3 times x plus 1. And so I can cancel the x plus 1s, and now that I have done that, I can try plugging in x equals negative 1 again. I get negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. Divide it by negative 1 minus 3. So negative 2 over negative 4 is equal to 1 half. All right, and then this last one, we're seeing x is approaching negative infinity, so we're thinking in behavior. And just like we have many times, and will again in the, in the next lesson, um, we're going to determine that by dividing the leading terms. So I have a negative x and 3x, so negative x over 3x, which equals negative 1 over 3, and I'm going to say, all right, well, the end behavior is that as x approaches infinity or negative infinity, y is going to approach negative 1 third, so that's going to be the value of the limit. Now we're going to wrap up by doing a little bit of maintenance on that rational inequality skill we built on last time. Um, it would be a real shame for you to do all that practice, you know, whenever you did it, and then, you know, kind of forget how to do it. Uh, we don't want that to happen. So the best way to prevent that from happening is going to just be by practicing regularly. Um, not that regularly, though. This isn't like the most important thing in pre-cal. But it's something we need to be able to do. Okay, what we got to do first, we set the inequality to zero. Then we identify our key numbers. All right, so x equals 5 is a zero of the denominator. And x equals 5 thirds is a zero of the numerator. Yeah, five divided by three times three was five, yeah, okay. So those are my key numbers. I make a number line, make a sign chart. Can't sketch a graph of this thing. It's not gonna work for you. Okay, five is definitely bigger than five divided by three. Okay, five divided by three, well, that's between one and two. Um, so I'm gonna choose, okay, between one and two, so I'll choose uh, maybe x equals three there. Um, I can choose 10 over here and 0 back here. Now, if you remember the thing about the multiplicity of the zeros in the numerator and the denominator, you can do that, or you can just test all three points. It's not that big of a deal to test three. So when x equals 0, I'm going to have negative 5 over negative 5, and that's a positive number. So I'm going to have positive there. When x equals 3, I'll have 9 minus 5 is 4, Divided by 3 minus 5 is negative 2. That's a negative number. And then, let's see. and then when x equals 10, I'll probably have positive and positive, right? I'll have 30 minus 5 is 25. Divided by 10 minus 5 is 5. So that's going to be a positive number. Okay, then since I'm looking for where I'm greater than or equal to 0, i gotta think, I got to think about where it's equal to 0. Okay, equal to 0 at x equals 5 thirds, okay, because this is 0 of the numerator. Zeros of the denominator cause vertical asymptotes, so, you know, that's not going to be part of my solution region. There's assume where it's greater than or equal to 0, so it's greater than through here, equal to 0 at x equals 5 thirds, and then greater than again from 5 all the way out to infinity. Okay, so my solution region is going to be negative infinity, up to 5 thirds, we're going to include 5 thirds unit, we're not going to include 5, and then we're going to go out to positive infinity.
And the last one we've got, it's, it's not set to zero first. We gotta start by doing that. So x minus two over x minus one minus one, subtract one from both sides is less than zero. Uh, but that's not gonna be good enough. I'm gonna need to you know convert the negative one into a fraction. And then I'm going to combine them once I get a common denominator, which I've got, right? I wrote that one is x minus one over x minus one, so I could combine with a common denominator. So I'm gonna say, all right, I have a new denominator of x minus one, I'm gonna have x minus two subtract x minus one. That's going to be less than zero. All right, now, whoops, I wrote that as if they were multiplied. Let me just fix that. So I'll have x minus two minus an x plus one over x minus one being negative. So x minus x is zero, negative two plus one is negative one over x minus one is negative. All right, we can figure this out. I'll identify my key numbers. Okay, my key numbers will be x equals one because that's the zero of the denominator. There are no zeros of the numerator, so that won't really contribute anything for me. So I only have one key number, and that'll be x equals one. All right, and then, so I guess it should make it relatively easy to make my sign chart. I'm gonna say, all right, here I've got one. I'll choose zero and two as my test points. And so I'm gonna say, all right, when x equals zero, I've got negative one over negative one. That does not, you know, give me a negative number. Okay, so I would assume when x is equal to two, that will work. I'll have negative one over two minus one is positive one. That's a negative number. Yeah, I'm good to go. I think about, okay, I'm looking for I'm less than zero, so I'm not interested in any of the key numbers. I wouldn't be interested in x equals one anyway, because it's a vertical asymptote. And so that's just gonna be where x is greater than one. And that's gonna be it for this video. Thanks for watching.